we have had the first pandemic way back one year okay everybody thought probably the problem is over and maybe we uh, will not see though it was completely anticipated a second wave it was expected to come so many experts uh, so many experts they believed okay so it's a natural course of the disease the second wave is likely but anyway we are in the mid of the second wave so currently covid has infected uh, like 18.4 million it's a, like a huge number basically okay it's a alarming number death 205000 so it's a, uh, it's like alarming number again per day within last 24 hour i am quoting a number it is 3498 people died because of covid so uh, no more we can neglect this disease right now okay whether we want or don't want whether we are comfortable with or not we are in the mid and we uh, so there are so many studies came out uh, like major studies they came with near about 80 to 85% patients or around 90% patients they get mild to moderate covid and probably they can be treated at home but near about 15 to 16% of patients they reach hospital out of them a major chunk they get away with a mild moderate symptoms with a ward or with op visit okay and a few percent of the patients they do come to icu they are our sick patients now they uh, require the utmost care now <laughs> today we have with the, the week journal india is the most credible national weekly uh, journal they have initiated this knowledge and awareness webinar with support from indian medical association the only national volunteer organization for the doctors who speak who, who stand who, who uh, care for the doctors uh, doctor community and the interest of the doctors and along with biocon biologics a leading global in india's largest biopharmaceutical company they came forward for sharing the knowledge and other things now further without further delay uh, i will uh, request and hand over the session to dr prachi sate uh, to begin the key that she is the head of icu ruby hall clinic grand medical foundation pune madam please next to you thank you thank you so much dr niranjan as you said we are really very thankful to ima the week and biocon for organizing this platform for all of us to interact can i share the screen so the numbers which were mentioned by dr niranjan were absolutely staggering and every day we are listening it from media that the number reached yesterday of new cases is a new high in the history of india and it is still not peaked so that is a bad news we are still in the middle of not only the second wave i think it is a tsunami which we are all going to get wiped off completely if we are not very uh, careful about preventing the disease picking it up early and preventing the patients from going into critical illness nevertheless still certain number of patients will go into critical illness and we are here to take an overview of what is happening in india if we compare india to the world you can see here still there are very large areas geographical areas which are affected with newer cases of covid coming in it is unfortunate to see that till about december india was doing very well but in the list you can see now india is the second worst affected only after the us to have number of cases affected with covid very high and that may be only the reported numbers unreported could be even higher as you can see here uh, the deaths are also rising significantly and you can see whatever we were calling as peak last year during september october november as compared to that the peak which we have reached this april is far far higher and in 14 days change you can see the death rate are staggeringly high staggeringly increasing you can see over here in the map of india maharashtra gujarat worst affected areas and kerala as well kerala tamil nadu in south india also we have got very very bad areas so what is how do we compare first wave and second wave actually second wave is much worse and i wish we were 
on the timeline after other Western countries or developed countries, and we should have learned from their experience. But probably we felt that we have learned it all and we have contained it all. And the human behavior in India was quite relaxed. And that is the reason why the second wave has become more fatal. Very high number of asymptomatic patients, very high number of patients who have got admitted in the hospitals and very high number of deaths also occurring. If we compare first wave and second wave, the hospitalizations during second wave have increased. The number of patients who have shown breathlessness as a symptom also has increased during second wave. Initially, we had only dry cough and sore throat as symptom in the first wave, but in second wave, there, there are quite altered symptoms which are manifesting. And that is the reason perhaps people are missing out initial few days. And that is why the R factor is increasing. And one index case is affecting far more number of patients in well, initial period before they get diagnosed and before they get isolated. The time has come probably for all of us to wear masks even at home because our senior citizens who have never got out of home are also getting affected probably because of the youngsters who are moving outside and bringing the disease home and at home we are not using masks. So it is really a painful situation to see the elderly people getting affected because of this. As per ICMR, 41.5% patients had oxygen requirement in first wave and in the second wave, it is almost 55%. And it is managing and we all know the tragedy that we are all facing. Oxygen sources are failing, ventilated beds are failing. People are not getting the beds they require according to their clinical conditions. The second wave has placed a major, major, major strain on the healthcare system. All the doctors have never said no to treat the patients, but you cannot fight missiles with a stick in your hand and the infrastructure is failing very miserably. The reports of oxygen supply shortages in the hospitals and hospitals having to turn away the patients. Never ever as intensivists, we have said no to bed in ICU for a deserving patient in our lifetime like this, like what we are doing currently. And it is very painful as a doctor working in ICU for me. You can see here India's daily COVID-19 death count as compared to September, October in 2020, and now in April 2021. It is staggeringly high. As was mentioned yesterday, 3,498 patients were killed. And this is the comparison with global. So daily new cases also are still increasing, but the deaths are increasing disproportionately. And that is what we have to keep in mind. Only the thankful situation is availability of the vaccines. Again, that was on our side and we should have taken advantage of it significantly well. We were much later on the timeline and as the first wave was waning off, we already had two of our indigenous vaccines. So as per WHO data, the first mass vaccination program started early in December 2020, and we just followed that. But despite that, our vaccination rates have reduced in current times, availability has reduced. Just to take a, a review on different types of vaccines available, there are seven different vaccines, three platforms have been administered. Till date, very large number of doses have been vaccinated all over the world. But if we actually take a look in India, till now, we have been able to vaccinate hardly 1.7% of our deserving population. WHO has gone all the way out to give emergency issue of emergency use listing for Pfizer. And similarly, in India, we have approved two emergency use vaccines. By March 2021, WHO issued EUL for COVID-19 vaccine developed by Johnson & Johnson single dose also. So WHO is on track for emergency licensing, but our program has to, have, which we have started successfully, has to keep the pace. As you would see over here, 160,000 doses were administered on day one and till date, Almost 1.5 crore, sorry, 15 crore uh, doses have been administered. DCGI had approved Covishield and as well as Covaxin. So we have availability. Sputnik is also getting introduced in India, but we really have to keep pace 
with vaccination the way we had started. What is the treatment development in India? Again, we were later on the timeline, so we had advantage of learning from others' experiences. Uh, AIMS has been kind enough to develop and circulate these protocols for mild disease, moderate disease, and severe disease. I'm sure I don't have to go through all the details. This is available on the net. But for home isolation and care, very simple things have been recommended. Oh, Symptomatic oh. management is recommended. Stay in contact with treating physician is one of the most important things because the physician and the medical team who supervises with teleconsultation for people who have been home isolated in oh, large oh. numbers is very important to pick up early signs of deterioration so that the patients can be given or moved to the higher category. So this is extremely important and people have learned to monitor their oxygen levels, their own temperatures, and they report their own symptoms. Home isolation was a great step forward in Indian scenario of managing COVID. There have been lots of public centers also for COVID isolation. But people who develop or the patients who develop respiratory rates more than 24 and feel the feeling of breathlessness or dyspnea with oxygenation hovering between 90 to 93 on room air have been advised to come to hospital for management of moderate disease where oxygen support starts getting needed or required. So here preferred devices for oxygenation are non-rebreathing face mask or venturi mask. And awake proning, everybody has learned in India, even at home and in hospitalized patients, which has definitely helped. About immunomodulatory therapy in the moderate disease, either anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory therapy, there have been various trials. Dexamethasone was one of the steroids which was reported in international observational trials. AIMS has recommended use of methylprednisolone as well, but equivalent dosages of both either of these steroids can be used. Patients may be initiated or switched to oral route if patients are stable and improving. Anticoagulation is one of the most useful things because a certain subgroup develops very high rising D-dimers and coagulability and injectable and or even oral anticoagulants have become useful for saving patients' lives or saving them from going into thromboembolic complications. Clinical monitoring during moderate uh, disease state is very, very important, including some of the repeat laboratory tests, HRCT thorax, or serial chest X-rays as needed. But unfortunately, certain number of patients do go in severe disease. And unfortunately, again, we do not have ex exact criteria to know who is going to go into the severe disease or severe state. Even though we are monitoring, we don't know uh, exactly, because some young patients are also going into severe disease, even though we know that the high number of comorbidities push them into severe disease, but even younger patients. And that is where the response of immune system of a patient comes into play, whether it is an adequate immune response or hyperimmune response also, which can be dangerous. And once the patient goes into severe disease, most of the times they require either high dependency unit or an ICU proper, where non-invasive or high flow oxygen sources have been used. And as you know, these NIV and HFNCs use very, very high flow rates of oxygen, probably which has led to deficiency of oxygen therapeutically. Intubation should be prioritized in patients with high work of breathing. Unfortunately, we keep on trying, delaying or prolonging the time, but we have to pick up exactly correct patient for intubation and use invasive ventilation in these. Again, anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory therapies are discussed and recommended in this, which includes steroids, anticoagulation, and then supportive measures. Well, all that is true. But then when we reach the end of it, what else? Do we have anything else? High risk, as it is listed over here, we are all aware, even the child in India knows who are high risk now. The drugs, remdesivir like drugs have really caused havoc in a way because it is it has 
come into perception of public as the only and useful and life saving drug which it is not oxygen is perhaps the most life saving drug remdesivir only could reduce the stay in the hospital by a few days and it cannot be used in renal or hepatic dysfunction and it is useful only if it is used in early phase of the disease but forgetting all that perhaps this is one of the drugs which is misused and all of us have to become very very aware that remdesivir is to be used only in certain selected subgroup of patients tocilizumab is another such drug which probably initially came as a miracle drug but it was very clearly observed that it is not useful for each and every patient and again we have to choose a subgroup where only in some patients it can be useful convalescent plasma came and went and it is being administered to certain patients preferably within 7 days of symptoms giving after that is of no use it becomes just like placebo and the plasma which is going to be actually used for trans uh, transfusion has to have certain amount of cut off of level of antibodies developed in these patients this is a new disease completely which has taken us unawares and various different types of drugs have been tried and used and none is still very very 100% useful or life saving in this many drugs came and went like chloroquine in this for example i'm not going to go through all the list which is available on the net but certain drugs do hold promise even though not precisely um, reclaimed as useful we know the pathophysiology that the portal of entry is mouth nose and the eyes mucous membrane perhaps when there is a dysfunctional immune response excessive infiltration of monocytes macrophages and t cells takes place in the respiratory system and then virus gets attached itself through its receptors to lung tissues or mucosa if that starts causing cytokine storm pulmonary edema and pneumonia starts this cytokine storm now is a buzzword which everybody has got aware in a way it is good because it will make us understand what is sepsis and how sepsis kills ultimately covid also is a part of sepsis which is going to affect us through interleukins tnf and leukotriene the symptoms of sepsis which cause death in 28% of fatal covid-19 cases are manifested because of cytokine storm ards or adult respiratory distress syndrome causes difficulty in breathing and hypoxia or low oxygen levels ards may lead directly to respiratory failure and in majority of patients ards is a single organ failure as far as respiratory system is concerned in covid-19 cases and causes fatality in a small percentage of patients there can be multiple organ failure because of this inadequate or dysregulated immune response as we call it which leads to involvement of any organ for that matter especially cardiac hepatic and renal systems most patients with sars cov-2 infection covid infection who progress to renal failure eventually die and renal failure needs to be treated and picked up early as well so hallmarks are two problem 1 and problem 2 and what is that influenza and other corona viruses develop a cytokine storm that can occur resulting in capillary leak syndrome organ injury and other complications which contributes to high risk of death due to high incidence of complications like ards shock kidney injury cardiac injury arrhythmias and other organ dysfunction so if you see over here the problem one is the actual disease of causing uh, co starting the disease process in the body and then there is a cytokine storm as you could see over here and then the vasoplegic shock and all the organs in the body getting affected ultimately leading to death so cytokine storm in covid is something as an eye opener and there are lots of things which we still have to learn it was suspected in uh, wuhan and then it has come a long way today for us to understand what is this cytokine storm and how we can uh, actually start picking it up early and treating it early so as to save very important lives which can be saved with that i will give it back to dr niranjan 
thank you very much next i will uh, uh, sir he is a chairman in institute of critical care uh, medicine and anesthesiology medanta hospital in medicity gurgaon so uh, sir, uh, sir would you like to uh, present your view or opinion on the expanding treatment landscape uh, in particularly the critically ill patients in indian context thank you dr panigri and thank you i am a okay i am a week for organizing this can you can see my slides yes yes we can see your slides yes sir yes yes sir okay so i'll talk a bit about the um, expanding scenario in the treatment of severe sepsis i bring you greetings from uh, vedanta the medicity this is the hospital where i work outskirts of uh, new delhi so as you all know that the third consensus conference of definition of sepsis sepsis three definition is a revised definition now there are basically only two things sepsis and the septic shock the sirs uh, concept and severe sepsis have been removed and what is it well it is basically a life threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response so mind you the main word here is life threatening dysregulated host response and organ dysfunction so the hostess response is not appropriate and that is where the cytokine storm comes in it's a not the enemy which kills you it's your own response to the enemy uh, which kills you at times and this is what it leads to which virtually uh, every organ can fail and this is where the sofa scores also come into assess the function so every patient is not the same so apples and oranges you cannot compare you don't know which patient is going which way and these are basically the pathogen has attacked whichever viral fungal or bacterial it's a bamp uh, uh, chemokines and then there chemicals which are released by the body uh, by the uh, damage to the body so damp uh, uh, chemicals are released and this is can which can lead to cytokine storm and ultimately uh, multi organ failure so there is a gap in therapy despite the advances in therapy you can see the mortality still remains high in septic shock so you, uh, you start the don't never forget the conventional therapy that means you resuscitate the patient initially you have source control because the sepsis will not be taken care of unless the source is uh, then you support the organ and that is where finally at the top of the pyramid um, uh, the adjuvant therapies uh, come in adjuvant therapies are to help the conventional therapies uh, that is the, like steroids and immunoglobulins extracorporeal adsorber and so on and what do they do well they basically restore the physiology and it helps in resolution of the inflammation and maybe a bit faster so it may remove endotoxin it may remove inflammatory cytokines it will remove chemokines restore the electrolyte and fluid balance so various types of extracorporeal therapies are available uh, the tore filter came with a big bang but there are multiple studies which showed the to the negative studies randomized large study euphrates study showed it no benefit um uh, in patients with uh, endotoxic shock then your lps adsorber then oxiris is still uh, evolving um and then you have the cytosol filter which is made by cytosolbins uh, usa and that's not really a filter it's an adsorber it primarily uh, it works in convection and adsorption it primarily removes the cytokine so they are basically very very small beads each bead is like a salt granule and it adsorbs the particular molecular weight so i'll come to that a bit later um, so the larger molecules may not be affected smaller molecules are adsorbed by the device so it's not really a filter it's an adsorber and this is the basic difference between a membrane filter and adsorber here you can see that the molecular uh, molecules which are bigger uh, they pass pass through they are not affected um, and the molecules which are in the right molecular weight will adsorb to the granules and when the fluid leaves then um, they are removed so it does not affect the electrolytes and albumin and so on and these are concentration dependent dependent adsorption so as the concentration is high there is a huge adsorption but as, as the concentration starts falling the adsorption rate also diminishes so it's a, more the cytokines more the removal less the cytokines less the removal. so this is again the pictorially uh, shows the same thing the larger molecules will not enter the beads the smaller molecules are adsorbed by the beads 
uh, which are within the uh, 5 to 55 uh, kilonatan uh, molecular size when we adsorb. So, the hydrophobic substances within that molecular weight are adsorbed. So, it's a polymer based uh, technology. It's a 10 to 55 kilonatan uh, molecules which are adsorbed and it is compatible with all dialysis modalities, with the SLED, with the conventional hemodialysis, and with CRRT. This is called a humongous surface area. Uh, it's very easy to set up. Normal membrane filters which you use uh, for hemofiltration, uh, the surface area is about one table tennis table, while this has a surface area equivalent to four uh, uh, football fields. So huge area, 45,000 square meters. And here it's between 10 to 55 kilodaltons molecules are all uh, adsorbed. So it will remove uh, cytokines, it will remove dams, it will remove PAMs, myoglobin, bilirubin, but it will not remove, mind you, it's important, neither will it remove albumin nor it will remove the immunoglobulins. So it uh, eliminates inflammatory cytokines, uh, both pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, PAMs and PAMs toxins and um, endo endotoxins may be removed, some toxins may be removed. It removes bilirubin and uh, myoglobin, it adsorbs hemoglobin, free hemoglobin, ammonia and bile salts and certain medications for which there is no uh, other way of removal like the newer NOAX, rivaroxaban, dabigatran, and ticacrolor and certain other uh, um, pharmaceutical agents like cutipine and um, certain calcium channel blockers are adsorbed by this. So, it adsorbs cytokines, bilirubin, ammonia and other chemicals. It is compatible, it is easy to use with most of the extracorporeal circuits like hemoperfusion here. So, this is a pump here, this is a cytosol filter, it goes back to the patient and here it is in a cardiopulmonary bypass, it is easily incorporated into the heart-lung machine. So, after the pump, you can this is the device which goes to the oxygen, the pipe which goes to the tube which goes to the oxygenator. This comes to the patient, and you take a side arm from there, goes to the filter again, goes back to the venous reservoir. It can be easily used with the ECMO. Again, here is the pump. You take a side arm through the pump after the pump, and that goes through the cytokine filter and goes back pre-filter. And again, it can be used with CRRT circuit. Either it's a pre-filter or it's a post-filter. Very easy to incorporate. It's very simple to use. More than one lakh twenty thousand have been devices have been used worldwide. Uh, it doesn't remove, as I said, immunoglobulins and uh, albumin. Uh, it doesn't activate the coagulation system, nor does it affect the, uh, the complement system. So it doesn't have any effect on that, and it's all biocompatible. So it doesn't affect uh, platelets no. also. So there is no risk of thrombocytopenia. When do we start it? Well, patients shows patients of sepsis shows signs of deteriorating, organ dysfunction, vasopressors increasing, not responding to the initial resuscitation, then within four to six hours, ideally one should start it. So increasing doses of uh, vasopressors, capillary leaks, organ dysfunction, worsening. Uh, and then if you're measuring certain biomarkers like PCT increasing or interleukin-6 is high, um, then uh, it's a time to, to use it. Once you use it, when do you stop using it? Well, it depends on how your patient is responding. If there is no response to the first therapy, I think there may not be any point in using the second time. But if the patient is responded to the first therapy, then after stopping the therapy, patient gets worse, then you can use a second device. So basically, endpoints would be reducing doses of vasopressors, uh, lactate levels are coming down, organ dysfunction is improving, uh, PF ratio is getting better, um, liver functions get better. So these are the times when you can stop the use of cytosol. Uh, so it attenuates the capillary leak. It will attenuate the refractory hypotension. Vasoplegic shock will be taken care of. It takes care of microcirculatory disorders and can also uh, improve the cardiomyopathy. So capillary integrity is preserved. Organ dysfunction improves. Marker circulation improves. And vasopressor needs significantly go down. Again, coming re reviewing what we discussed, well, it removes inflammatory cytokines, inflammatory mediators, chemokines. Uh, it, it can remove certain uh, pharmaceutical agents like the NOAX, and free hemoglobin, myoglobin, bilirubin, and certain drugs. Where you can use it? Well, first indication would be sepsis and septic shock. It has been used, more than a thousand devices have been used in COVID-19. 
It's been used in a large number of patients, lots of publications in cardiac surgery, um, uh, liver failure, rhabdomyolysis, and certain intoxication into dengue fever and sn snake uh, poisoning. There are multiple papers, thousands of papers worldwide. Uh, safety is no question, it is a very safe device to use. Uh, and most of the studies have compared expected mortality versus the patient's mortality. These are the three papers which we published. Uh, one is uh, in, uh, in septic shock, uh, one general critical care medicine, and two in the American the general cardiovascular and thoracic anesthesia. This was one was bilirubin removal, so it absorbed a huge amount of bilirubin in a patient who was third time being operated. And this was in major aortic surgery, like aortic arch replacement and so on. So I did a comparative study, which was published. It was quite beneficial. So what did we find? Coming to, since this is primarily about so, uh, uh, sepsis we are talking about, so primarily what did we find in 100 patients of septic shock? We found reduction in uh, significant reduction in vasopressor requirement, significant reduction in hemodynamic stabilization, improvement in uh, the severity scores of illness, and improvement in lab parameters. We also observed the survival outcome was better in patients where the cytosol was used within 48 hours of septic shock and the chances of survival decreased with the delay in initiation of the cytosol therapy. Over the years, more than 1,21,000 devices have been used worldwide, huge number of scientific publications and many registered ongoing publications. So it's an ongoing process uh, and more to see. Concluding what I have talked about, Sepsis and septic shock are among the leading causes of death in intensive care worldwide. Cytokines play a crucial role in complex pathophysiology and underlying sepsis. Um, and the special indications besides that are liver disease and dysregulated immune response, and it helps in promoting tissue uh, destruction and reducing inflammation. Current modal, uh, treatment modalities, the modality is still high worldwide. Extracorporeal therapies like cytosol through adsorption of excess cytokines and metabolites provides window opportunity to doctors to address immune dysregulation in critically ill hyperinflammatory patients. Cytosol use may improve survival, reduce ICU and hospital length of stay by reducing cytokines, low calcitonin, vasopressor requirement and organ so Thank you very much uh, for your attention and I will hand over the proceedings to Dr. Pani I would request a Professor Zoll to take up the next session, please. See the right slide now. I can see my good friend Yaki made a nodding, so I take it as a, as a good signal. So a very warm welcome to you in India, and let me tell you that uh, uh, my whole heart goes out for you. Uh, we had a very difficult time here in Hungary. It is easing off now a bit. But the mortality was very high and Hungarian healthcare dealt with nothing else basically but emergencies and COVID-19 over the last uh, two months. So I wish you all the best to get this situation under control. Uh, well, those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Jolt Monar and I am a professor in anesthesiology and intensive therapy. I've been in the practice for more than 30 years now and um, I have a disclosure to make here because uh, for a year and a half I, uh, I am since uh, 2019 I'm also a senior medical director at Cytosolvens so in addition to my academic affiliation in Hungary and in Poland I also work for Cytosol as well. So um, my task today is to talk about the uh, possibility uh, or the rationale of PMO absorption in COVID-19 patients. So we had two very nice lectures um, about the background. Uh, so let me just um, take you through this uh, from a little bit of a different um, perspective. Um, our immune system has uh, two components, the innate and the adaptive. And whatever happens to us, uh, um, the immune system reacts. Let it be infection or any type of trauma or injury. And our immune system, as you can see it on this figure, increases its activity. Now we can call the innate, the pro-inflammatory and adaptive, the anti-inflammatory forces. The role of the pro-inflammation is to get rid of the dead tissue in trauma and to <clears throat> kill the invading pathogens. And the role of anti-inflammation 
to keep this process under control. Now, if you are healthy, although you feel awful, you have aches and pains and high temperature, but if you are uh, healthy, then without any medical help, you can recover within six to eight days. But the problem uh, with critically ill patients that uh, this nicely balanced pro and anti-inflammatory process goes out of control and the pro-inflammation overwhelms uh, anti-inflammation patients can die due to multiple system organ failure, uh, which is caused by the cytokine storm. So uh, it follows some kind of theoretical logic that attenuating the burden of hyperinflammation at this stage uh, may be beneficial for our patients. But is it true or not? This is uh, <clears throat> one of the first animal experiments uh, from the group of John Kellum from the USA, from Pittsburgh. And what they did, they exposed rats to a septic shock and they uh, used the cecum ligation and puncture model. And 24 after cecum, cecum lig uh, ligation and puncture, uh, they randomized the animals into two groups. One was the dark columns indicating animals were treated with uh, cytokine removal. And the other group was the control group, both in, in septic shock. And you can see here that all the measured inflammatory biomarkers were significantly lower in the cytosol uh, animals within a matter of, uh, of three hours. So a very effective removal of cytokines. Now, whether it can be translated into clinical benefit for our patients, well, it is still under investigation and possibly uh, one of the, the most powerful uh, studies that we have. It is still a retrospective propensity score match study from the Netherlands, from Rotterdam. But what they found, they compared septic shock patients who were treated with CRRT to patients who were in septic shock treated with CRRT and cytosol. And as compared to the predicted mortality, very high predictive mortality in the, of these patients, but there was a significant reduction in the observed, the actual mortality. Now, doing a comparison between these two groups, uh, the difference wasn't significant, but when they did a special propensity weight matched analysis, then um, the cytosol treated patients had a significantly lower 20% uh, less uh, mortality than the control group. So we can say that um, uh, cytokine removal may improve survival in patients with septic shock on renal replacement therapy. Now, let's focus now only on COVID-19 patients. Um, a <clears throat> kind of storm and an imbalance between um, pro and anti-inflammation can occur in not just in sepsis, in any of these conditions uh, depicted here on this figure, including influenza and uh, other uh, non um, inflammatory conditions like pancreatitis, just a major surgery. Uh, Dr. Meta mentioned cardiac surgery already, liver failure. So we went through all of that. And um, any of these conditions can cause an imbalance between pro and anti inflammation. We can call it cytokine storm, dysregulated host response. And to regain balance between anti and pro inflammation, uh, it um, follows some logic to. Um, to attenuate this uh, hyperinflammatory condition. In COVID-19, uh, there is uh, hyperinflammation. This is a very nice paper by Tai and co-workers, uh, which summarizes, they called it the trinity of COVID-19, the immunity, inflammation, and intervention. And uh, there are several ways our body can protect us from the invading virus. And um, in, on this figure, you can see the components uh, on different stages where our body, our immune system can handle and protect uh, be, uh, us being infected. And fortunately, 80% of the infected cases are asymptomatic. However, there is another group of patients in whom there are mild symptoms or moderate symptoms and another group, a smaller cohort, but more uh, patients are, are um, acquiring the infection, the more um, the larger this cohort is, in whom hyperinflammation uh, develops. And um, uh, they also call it cytokine storm. And you can see that this nice structure here becomes damaged big time. The virus invades the cells. There is capillar increased capillary impermeability and all the other consequences of hyperinflammation, including pulmonary edema and widespread inflammation and multi-organ failure. Now, in this patient population, 
we have uh, tested uh, several alternatives and Dr. Sati has gone through most of them, uh, including um, mechanical removal of cytokines with adsorption. And just one quote from this paper, from their conclusion, that they believe that controlling inflammatory response may be as important as targeting the virus. And this was also depicted by uh, very important uh, key opinion leaders in intensive care, Jean-Louis Vincent, Paolo Navalese, and Claudio Ronco, that in these COVID-19 patients, hemoabsorption and hemoperfusion should be considered. And this was taken so seriously as we went along uh, during the pandemic that in the United States in, 19, in 2020, April, uh, the uh, FDA granted uh, emergency use application for cytosol. It was only compassionate use, uh, as allowed as a compassionate use until that point. But since April, it is allowed for emergency use in these patients. And several countries uh, um, have taken this on. And you can see the list of those which uh, included now in their treatment protocol, some sort of hemoadsorption, even the WHO um, acknowledges uh, uh, this as a treatment alternative. And um, how it evolved, why physicians started to use cytosome. This is a very good example, uh, Dr. Durham uh, from the United States, from Milwaukee. And it went on the news there as well, because when um, uh, they had to treat uh, three very ill uh, patients uh, who required um, ECMO therapy. They started COVID-19, uh, they started cytosorb therapy in these patients and all three patients were discharged. And it was a big media um, reflection. Uh, this case had a media reflection as well. So, um, but it, these are only uh, anecdotal stories. But what about the published data? Well, we don't have much, but we have some published data. Uh, this is a small uh, preliminary analysis coming from Freiburg, Germany. COVID-19 caused pneumonia patients requiring ECMO therapy were uh, randomized into cytokine absorption and without cytokine absorption. And this is their first report uh, that they found a rapid removal of IL-6 in the cytokine absorption treated patients as compared to controls. This is a case report. Again, uh, a very ill patient, COVID-19 pneumonia, ECMO requirement. And when they started cytokine absorption, C-reactive protein, IL-6, uh, decreased rapidly, which was also followed by a decrease in noradrenaline. And their conclusion was that COVID-19 patients on BV ECMO, they observed this um, rapid reduction and they also recommended its use. Um, this is, again, a very small um, study from Italy and uh, uh, patients with, with the coronavirus caused pneumonia uh, were compared and those who, who were uh, treated with cytosol, they had pretty good survival rate while everybody in the control group died. Of course, we are only talking about a few patients here, but they observed uh, a rapid decline and reduction in the um, oxygenation in uh, those patients who did not receive cytosorb, while it was more or less stable, both in survivors and non-survivors. And there was a little bit of a drop in non-survivors, but the cytosorb treated patients did better than um, those um, who received, uh, who did not receive cytosorb therapy. And they concluded that their experience suggests the potential beneficial role of adjuvant therapy in these patients. And possibly the most uh, relevant data that we have so far is coming from Saudi Arabia, from Dr. Lahartis group. And um, they uh, treated patients who were adults, uh, needed intubation, needed renal replacement therapy, and had life-threatening COVID-19 infection. Now they defined life-threatening if the patient had ARDS, uh, if, if the patient had high Apache 2 score, were in septic shock or had cytokine release syndrome. And these patients then were treated with cytosol and cytosol was discontinued when oxygenation normalized, blood pressure normalized and shock subsided as defined by low lactate levels and um, no electrolyte abnormalities. Now, using this approach, they treated 50 patients and 35 survived, 15 died and they compared, uh, looked at the features of these patients. Now on admission, 
It was an inclusion criteria, but indeed the patients had quite high Apache 2 score, uh, which corresponds to a predictive mortality of more than 30, 70%. And then the actual mortality was only 30%. So uh, on its own, it is quite a remarkable result. And um, they looked at before cytosorb therapy and after cytosorb therapy, survivors, non-survivors, uh, what was the clinical and biochemical feature of uh, the therapy? And um, what mm, I would like to draw your attention here to is that the patients received two plus minus one cytosorb. So one or two, maximum three treatments. So we are talking about admission and two to three treatments, basically maximum. And within that short uh, treatment period, two three days, uh, noradrenaline was stopped in every uh, survival patient. Or on the other hand, those who did not survive, their noradrenaline requirement increased. Lactate also normalized in the um, survivor group while it went uh, in, into ridiculously high levels in, in the non-survivors. So this indicates that um, and if you observe the early response to cytosorb, it can be a good signal for you to, to detect responders, non-responders, and um, who are in, in danger and who are not. Now, uh, there were other results as well. Those patients who survived, they had a rapid improvement in oxygenation before and after treatment. While non-survivors, there was a decline. A SOFA score also reduced, so massive improvement uh, among survivors, deterioration in non-survivors, and IL-6 also decreased in, in survivors, which increased in non-survivors. So this was their conclusion that CRRT and cytosorb is a safe potential risk therapy in critical COVID-19 patients with Aki, ARDS, septic shock, and hyperinflammation. So we have several other case reports, but I don't want to um, take up unnecessarily your time. They all more or less report the same what I have shown you so far. Uh, and of course, uh, we are uh, on an Indian meeting now, and um, uh, I present you this article with pleasure. Uh, Yati Mehta is the first author. It is a nice summary and a very nice overview on, um, on um, adjunctive therapies in, in COVID-19 patients. And uh, they discuss in the paper several alternatives, including blood purification systems. Read this article, it's, it's, it gives a, a nice overview on what's going on. And um, they conclude that these alternatives can possibly alter the outcome, but more evidence needs to be generated. And um, uh, this is my uh, next to last slide. Yes, the evidence uh, generation is in progress. And this is a nice summary. My, my colleague Volker Humbert put that together. So we have RCTs ongoing. We have uh, case series with control groups, case series without control groups. And more or less, um, they report the same removal of inflammatory mediators, improvement in hemodynamics, and some also uh, indicate improvement in, uh, in uh, oxygenation and the mortality varies, uh, but uh, I mean, the numbers are too small to make any firm conclusion on that matter. Uh, however, so evidence is being generated, but the question is whether we can um, wait for evidence generation uh, in a pandemic, in a devastating pandemic, or should we just uh, use the pathophysiological rationale, use the experience of others and uh, give it a chance in our patients? It is a difficult decision, needless to say. Uh, so um, my last slide um, summarizes what we recently put together in a, another review article uh, on COVID-19 and, um, and uh, um, hemoadsorption. A paper uh, is being submitted as we speak, and uh, this figure was taken from the paper. So the conditions when you can consider hemoadsorption, uh, in our view, is refractory vasoplegic shock, severe ARDS, those um, patients who require uh, ECMO because of ARDS, those who, uh, in addition to their COVID-19 infection, develop the acute um, kidney failure stage three require adrenal replacement therapy, and those uh, who have very high age score, which suggests the cytokine release syndrome. So uh, with this, uh, I conclude, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you have. Thank you. Back to our chairman.
Thank you so much, Professor Solt Molnar, for taking us through the global perspective of the cytokine adsorber. We all these critically ill patients. So thank you so much once again. We'll take up the questions during the panel discussion, and I would request you to be uh, with us uh, till then. Thank you so much. Uh, with this, I would request Dr. Aparna Mukherjee to share her thoughts on organic development of critical clinical management guidelines for COVID-19 patients in India. Dr. Aparna is presently scientist E, Clinical Trials and Health Systems Research Unit, Epidemiology and Communicable Diseases Division of Indian Council of Medical Research, Department of Health and Research. May I request Dr. Aparna to please take us through. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, Dr. Bhargav was originally supposed to take the stock. He's a bit uh, tied up. So I'm representing uh, ICMR right now. So if I start, I am in charge of the clinical trial unit at ICMR, and we've been involved with the trials related to COVID-19. And uh, I'll just take you through some glimpses of how we have been trying to develop guidelines for the very difficult management of COVID-19. So I'll just share the slides. Yeah, I hope you can see the slides. So we are calling this organic development because this is, as we all know, a living dynamic process because there is nothing set in stone to be able to say that, yes, these are the treatments and this is what you have to follow. Uh, it's a new virus. It's a new disease. There has been unprecedented spread across the world. We do not really know cure in any terms of uh, be it mild, moderate, severe, or the critically ill patients. So what we have been banking on since the start of the pandemic is symptomatic management and definitely repurposing of drugs as per our understanding of the pathophysiology of this COVID-19 disease. And as time has evolved and as we have understood a little bit better than what we did last March, April 2020, uh, we have started uh, changing and modifying our, the way we treat these patients. So uh, like if we talk of our national guidelines, which we you all are aware of, uh, it started in March last year, uh, which then got revised periodically in June, July, as well. and now uh, the latest update is in April this year. So I'll just uh, take you through some of the important or very oft talked about uh, components of this guideline that has changed over the time. Uh, we start with convalescent plasma, which there has been a lot of talk on this, and there still is a lot of talk on this. And uh, this is an age old strategy against infectious disease. So the initial concept was very enticing, but uh, you know, it was always supposed to be a bridging uh, type of uh, therapy till we could find some kind of a cure because there definitely is biological plausibility. Plasma of somebody who has recovered from COVID-19 should have antiviral neutralizing antibodies. Apart from that, it should also have some, it has shown to have some other um, effects like the antibody dependent cytotoxicity, complement activation. It also has a plethora of anti-inflammatory cytokines, which might help in the cytokine storm. So this was the basis on which the whole process of plasma, convalescent plasma started. And you, we had Arturo Casadevall's group promoting it and FDA giving it the emergency use authorization. And the advantage is that it's available because we have such a large number of patients who are recovering from COVID-19. It's cheaper than most of the drugs. If we talk of hyperimmune immunoglobulins, monoclonal antibodies, this is much cheaper than them. And we have been using plasma for ages, not convalescent plasma, but standard plasma. And so we know it's relatively safe. So that's why I started the whole process. And we at ICMR, we wanted to generate our own data, Indian data, which is very important. And uh, with the help of a number of medical college and colleges and hospitals across the country, 
who really stepped up to participate in this RCT, we were able to complete a randomized control trial within four months of the start of the pandemic. And this uh, open level RCT included moderate COVID-19 patients, that is what we are defining as uh, with respiratory rate more than 24, SpO2 less than equal to 93%, or a PF ratio of 200 to 300, and only adult patients. And our ultimate outcome, we wanted a hard endpoint, so the composite measure of either progression to severe disease or any cause mortality within 28 days were our primary outcome. So we gave two doses of 200 ml of convalescent plasma, 24 hours apart, and that was compared with the whatever best standard of care was available. So this kind of shifted gradually uh, in the course of our city, but then it remained same in both the arms. Uh, we did have a limitation in the study, which has also been talked about, that we did not measure the neutralizing antibodies a priori because it was done during the lockdown and we could not really do it at that time, but we stored all our plasma and tested it later on. So this is just our distributions where we had 464 randomized patients and we did an ITT on 235 and 229 patients finally. And if we do compare, we see that there was no difference between the two arms. In fact, if you talk of the mortality within 28 days, it was 14.9 and 13.8 in either arm. So that's like hardly any difference. Even if we consider um, those patients who had uh, received a higher titer of, uh, of plasma, higher titer plasma, even in that small subgroup, or in that subgroup also, there was no difference. But what we found very interestingly is that the recipients who were at on an average about uh, eight days from their symptom onset, they already had developed antibodies in them. They had quite a high titer of neutralizing antibodies present in them. So actually loading them with more type antibodies from outside uh, did not work. So, but uh, interestingly, even that subgroup where the patient did not have an antibody developed as yet, they also did not show any difference when given convalescent plasma as to when not given. So this is like a very theoretical thing with the RCTs that we've had. There are more, but I just picked up some important ones. Initial, we had from China, we have some Mm, I think somebody's commenting. I'm sorry, I missed some of the primary outcomes, but most of them were uh, either mortality or uh, progression to severe disease. So we had, but the uh, problem with the initial ones, like in the Chinese, the Chinese one or the Netherlands one, the second one is from Netherlands or the Spanish one was that they could not complete their RCT because by the time these RCTs actually took off, their case load had come down and so they could not complete their enrollment. So uh, at that point they were showing some uh, idea of improvement but nothing reached statistical significance. But now then our study also did not reach any statistical significance, no difference. But now we have got more RCTs in our hand. So we have from uh, US, we have from Chile, we have from LIPS, this is the infant COVID group, which actually took, um, you know, studied in elderly patients. And now we know that it is the time that is important when we are giving the plasma, the titer that is important, and the age that is important. Because otherwise, if you give an indiscriminate everybody, it really doesn't show any difference, as was shown by the recovery trial, which had about 10,000 patients enrolled. So that is a good enough number, a large number we can be conclusive from such trials. Uh, these are some observational studies that actually showed initially that yes, plasma is working, but I'm not going through them uh, you know, each by each. That will be too much like a class. But what was interesting about convalescent plasma is that uh, all these observational studies, they were large studies, but they did not have any comparator. And they always showed that there was some improvement, some improvement as to whatever historically we are considering as the mortality rate if not, no plasma is not given. But whenever we're coming to RCTs, 
be it the ones which could not be completed in the initial phase to the ones which are now being completed, they are not showing any effect of the convalescent plasma. Then there was a paradigm shift as to when it is being given. Initially, it was being given in critically ill, severe patients. Gradually, the time shifted, and we have now understood that its main property is the antiviral property, so it has to be given very early. Titers have to be really high, and probably it is a subset of elderly patients who are responding the best. So that's what our current uh, idea about convalescent plasma is. And some uh, rare concerns have been brought up that it might lead to pulmonary thromboembolism. There might be uh, escape of variance development if we have not been able to actually neutralize the virus properly. But these are more of theoretical concerns. But still, at present, I mean, plasma is not really what we uh, started out with as a very good alternative, as a very good uh, uh, method of treatment. We really have to select our patients, give a high titer, only then maybe we can see some uh, effect. Whatever, anecdotally, whatever we get that it is working and people are, you know, going around to collect plasma, but this is what evidence says. And then if we talk of steroids, in the initial guidelines of March, April, there were no recommendations of steroid. But as we realized, we did an informal survey of the institutes and we found that most of them were using steroids, as you are all aware that in particularly in severe and critically ill patients, they were already using steroids, though the, you know, dose and what steroid they were using for what duration, that was very variable. Then we had the landmark recovery trial. And so we all now know that yes, dexamethasone does work. Steroid in any form basically works and reduces all cause mortality. But again, we have to be careful as to when we are giving it because if uh, no oxygen is received and the patient is only in the mild moderate phase where oxygen is not being given, there is no breathlessness and we start steroid, we may actually do more harm than good because we are going to increase the viral replication. But once oxygen is required, mechanical ventilation is required, then steroid becomes helpful. So again, here we'll have to keep in mind that we'll have to counsel all our patients that uh, when we are saying that stay at home, home isolate and treat yourself, just don't start steroids by yourself, just thinking that it's going to work. It's only on the advice of medical practitioner when there is a fall in oxygen saturation and oxygen is required, only at that point steroid will be helpful, which is usually after seven days of the symptom onset. Again, another interesting component uh, molecule that we have is remdesivir. Uh, somebody in the various social media forwards that we all are getting nowadays just commented that remdesivir is a drug which is in search of a virus. It was originally, uh, you know, originally discovered for Ebola, it did not have much effect in Ebola, neither in MERS or SARS. Here uh, in this pandemic also, it's showing a very uh, conflicting kind of studies we are getting. The initial studies that we got, that is Act 1, the original study, where it showed that it can reduce to, uh, it can lead to a reduction in the hospital stay, that is a uh, improved time of recovery, but it did not show any mortality benefit even in that study. Then solidarity trial, which had a quite a large uh, sample size of about more than around 5,000. There, uh, they, they could not show any mortality benefit at day 28. The uh, network analysis has been done by WHO. That also shows no mortality benefit when all the five RC, all five RCTs have been taken in that. So still now remdesivir remains an investigation therapy, though now it has become a household name. So it has to be given only in hospitalized patients on oxygen. Again, this is an antiviral drug. So preferably it needs to be given in the viremia phase, not when the patient is already deteriorating because of the cytokine storm and going into mechanical ventilation. And we all have to remember that it's not life-saving. So, uh, you know, really running after remdesivir may not be so beneficial. And uh, 
this is a living document, as I said, a dynamic living document. So there's been a lot of changes. So there was HCQs and azithromycin, which seemed to be the wonder drug. It was being given in all types of severity. So now it has gradually come down so that it really doesn't have much evidence to be given at any form, any severity, but still, if you do want to give it, you can give it in the mild phase. Similarly, ivermectin, which is again being touted as a wonder drug, and uh, does have some RCTs uh, conducted for ivermectin, but they again do show some positive trend, uh, you know, trend in reducing mortality, but then probably we need more uh, evidence than we can in general say that everybody should use uh, ivermectin. We have a very good, uh, well-conducted RCT, which has recently been published, which used inhaled butasonide. So if people are having symptoms, cough, and uh, beyond five days of onset, uh, inhaled butasonide might be used and it is it might show recovery. And since this is anyhow used so widely and we know there are not much side effects, this can be used. Tocilizumab again is an expensive drug severely critically ill patients, it might show some benefit. But here also there has been changes, developments as we started with a higher dose of eight milligram per kg. But experts have been saying that for our patients, this might lead to more of side effects than what benefits we are getting. So the doses have been reduced and now it is being recommended at a four to six milligram per kg for whatever worth it is. So uh, this is an interesting time and a very sad time that we are living through where we have to every day update what we want to give to our patients and what we can actually offer to them to uh, bring about some kind of clinical improvement. So there is always a change, a paradigm shift in what we are thinking as treatment today and what we might think as treatment tomorrow. Uh, so this is what this was just a short glimpse as to how we have been changing our guidelines. And uh, thank you for inviting me and any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Aparna, for your valuable insights. Now I would like to kindly request Dr. J. A. J. Lal to share his thoughts on overcoming COVID-19, a case of global inclusiveness and sharing best practices with our audience and also his pointers on sessions we have had to. Dr. Jailal is the national president for Indian Medical Association, the largest voluntary organization of doctors of modern scientific system in India. Over to you, Dr. Jailal. It's such a proud and pleasure to have you here with us. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, it is a great uh, opportunity for me to represent Indian Medical Association and to be part with you. I just gone through and the uh, very, very eminent and uh, very uh, important topics which you had discussed and many important points you have shared. I think it has cleared the various myths and spell which arises on the usage of various drugs and the need for them and the way in which we need to go. But we must all realize that we are now almost in a very grim situation where almost uh, in there our hospital beds are full. It is becoming a, a great challenge for the people when who are uh, really in need an ICU bed to get an ICU bed. Yes, though we say it is a scientifically and systematically use of a rational drug has to be promoted, but yet the demand for remdesivir is apparently rising very high. The shortage is being felt very much in the clinical practitioners. Uh, what we are seeing in the second wave is more and more uh, severe cases are coming to the hospital. That, uh, though we say the number of cases, uh, more than 3.5 lakhs people are affected. And whatever the people coming or most of them are having a need to have uh, more oxygen and more uh, intensive therapy is needed. So that is becoming a, a definitely a, a difficult situation. I must also appreciate the government of India, the ICMR and various other uh, organizations working down the clock to mitigate these issues and uh, various efforts have been taken to bring in uh, the required oxygen, the required uh, remdesivir and uh, the, even to some extent we are able to make the makeshift hospital beds and small small uh, rooms and the buildings were now converted into the hospital beds. But it is quite difficult to bed convert in ICU beds, still we are trying our level best to see to that. 
the people who are getting affected it is very painful to note that uh, uh, people of the lesser age groups are being affected people without the comorbidities are uh, getting affected uh, as on day today in the last 25 days 28 days of the second wave we have lost our medical fraternity nearly 82 people uh, died this is unprecedented which we have never seen that such a large number of young people doctors dying to the uh, in the front line or case and the morale of the doctors are at present little uh, grim because they are facing to they are at extra time they need to work the amount of load of patients who are coming in and they are exposing to the viral load is uh, i mean very heavy they are not given adequate time to rest and the quarantine period is we are not able to provide the good quarantine period to them so now uh, we we are very very painful to uh, say that um, almost 82 doctors has died as on date and every day the more and more people are succumbing i was also told today in another uh, webinar 52 of the journalists have died in the last 25 days so that shows the along uh, the the, uh, the the gravity of the situation in which we are now living and with this the modern medical practitioners has to work hard we always talk about the inclusive approach where is every one of us now need to come into that one is a medical professionals and where they, their morale has to be kept high and their situation and their needs to be addressed and uh, their uh, band out the, the psychological trauma uh, in front of them they have to deny a bed to a needy icu patient in front of their eyes the people are dying without uh, adequate oxygen and this all are uh, psychological trauma a doctor cannot uh, mean overcome in his mind and that is a very very grim situation and his colleagues are dying so this is a very situation so at this point so the government and all of us has to do uh, something good to do the uh, encourage the medical fraternity and and also increase and augment the medical shortage i always used to say whether the remdesivir or the oxygen shortage and uh, the, the other countries can help the, the programs like inclusive uh, import can be done, but it cannot be done all of a sudden for the manpower. The manpower shortage uh, is going to be a great crisis, which the government, the healthcare, uh, the health officials has to plan in ahead to augment this healthcare uh, medical care service uh, professional. There are different options in front of them, but unfortunately, uh, for various reasons, I'm not sure then why, but the government is not coming forward to augment this. One of the easiest way is uh, this uh, NEET PG entrance exams. We all know uh, 1.78 lakhs doctors have applied for the exam. The exams are supposed to be held at the March 18th, sorry, April 18th, but it was postponed. And now people are not knowing that when these exams are going to be conducted. And as long as these exams are not conducted, these 1.78 lakh doctors will not uh, join the service because they will be preparing for this exam. And once the exams are rolled over, at least 35,000 people will be joining as a postgraduate and the rest will come as a junior doctors. So there is a big chunk of doctors are uh, uh, now waiting for the exams to be conducted. For what we are going to conduct the exam? When they are coming, they are going to serve in the COVID ward. When they are going to come with the COVID ICU, they are going to come and serve in the uh, medical colleges where the COVID patients are taken care. And at this moment, we cannot cite as a COVID as a reason for not conducting the examination some means and ways should be identified and the exam should be conducted so that will augment the healthcare professionals in the in the area equally we need uh, more of nursing graduates almost two lakhs nursing graduates are waiting for the exams to be conducted and once the exams are conducted and there is a possibility they will be also joining so now this is uh, one of the very important uh, 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 need which the the covid pandemic need to address is a, a healthcare a manpower augmentation because that is going to be a very important thing in the uh, intensive care management or the the severe cases pain management when the patient knows the shock management we need manpower and without manpower it will not be possible so the out of other knowledge we are talking about that uh, the the scientific inputs we need the, the therapeutic inputs we need but the manpower input is also needed and that is going to be the most important inclusive uh, management of the severe cases second we need to uh, curtail this chain the break the chain concept has to be there if the daily inflow of the case is going to rise like this and our hospitals will not be able to tolerate the inflow of cases and it is at a particular point though it is painful and the government has to take a decision of enforcing a lockdown 
we shall not think of uh, economic uh, burden at this moment but living alone and sustaining the life is more important and thinking of the economic burden so the lockdown if you can ensure at uh, a national level or at least in a uh, in a, a selective areas where the state level and that is going to at least the break the chain if you see in uh, maharashtra if you see in delhi after the strict lockdown and there was we are at least be in the plateau there is no much increase of the cases 66000 65000 that is a plateau we are able to maintain and that is possible only with the lockdown it is there so at this time and another important the government inclusive role it has to be played is containing this virus and containing this virus can be done uh, where we all can say it is a selective isolated containment that needs extra manpower it is not possible at this moment to have a manpower to have isolated selective uh, containment zone what they can theoretically we can say it easily but practically enforcing isolated dog containment zones will be a great great difficult to have the manpower on that so we need to have a lockdown the third is uh, the role of the uh, common man which is uh, also going to be a very very important thing in the, the uh, inclusive management of this issue that is the uh, covid appropriate behaviors that all of us know we have talking for it for a long time the covid appropriate behaviors and adhering to that and having a zero tolerance is the most important thing but more so the weapon in front of us is the vaccination and every one of them if they have to come as a vaccination that means and one vaccination and you can go into save us one remedy severe at least and one oxygen cylinder at least because if we can and vaccinate one individual that mean to say that that particular person is not going to be land up as a severe case or the case we needs uh, an intensive care treatment so preventing a patient coming to the intensive care treatment the option in front of us only is a vaccination so we need to go ahead with very aggressively a individual person has to take the vaccination not only to protect himself but also to protect the society also to protect and uh, by ensuring the herd immunity is come to the country and we will be able to have a society so that is a role which an individual as a whole we need to play uh, for the uh, overall beneficial for the even the person who is uh, suffering with a, a shock or suffering with a, a severe case that prevention and by the self isolation or even self lockdown that is a word now we are using uh, uh, every individual has to think that even if the government is not coming for with the lockdown and we should see that i am going for a self lockdown and unless it is appropriate in this uh, un- i mean unavoidable i will not come out that can't that, that 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 mental strength you now every individual has to develop and also go ahead with the vaccination unfortunately again we are finding it very difficult to push on the a uh, vaccination drive it is after a great deal a great struggle by the indian medical association and very learned colleagues the concept of vaccinating for all above 18 has come but this concept of vaccinating all above 18 is not going to be on the limelight uh, from may 1 as it was been announced because most of the states has now having no stocks to go ahead but still even if it is not there the gold there at least even if it's not may 1 at least in the next week we will be able to go ahead but with the system of a differential pricing which is available which is been announced by the government it is going to be a big big burden again if smallpox we are able to eradicate if the polio we are able to eradicate it is only because of the universal free supply of the vaccination but today with the concept of differential pricing system where in the private practice someone has to pay a large money about 2500 rupees for the two dose and for a family of five that means the 10000 that is not going to happen in this country and uh, in, it is our uh, we are trying our level best to enforce on the government that they are going to make it as a universal vaccination so that has to, so now it has been in a situation however advanced scientific knowledge we are going to transmit to our medical fraternity however important research we are doing and say that whether remdesivir is an experimental drug or remdesivir is an a drug the success of this covid pandemic management comes in the prevention of that and ensuring the breaking the chain concept for that we all of us need to work not only we as a medical fraternity alone but also the planning administrators has to do a lot of good work to come out in an altruistic way not with an any other intention and also an every individual should feel that this is a duty they are going to serve for the society this is their right responsibility for the well being of the community so that kind of a belonging that kind of possessing that kind of 
involvement, a participatory involvement in this fight against the corona, if it has been perceived by all of us, then only it will be possible to see the high-tech work being done by the very great uh, expert speakers here who has uh, expressed the scientific arena. So I am thankful to the Week magazine and the organization for organizing this such an uh, innovative program where uh, all the uh, people are brought in together. And uh, let us take it as a big, big uh, uh, agenda in front of us, a challenge in front of us. And we, I always believe, and when you are a, a, a really committed person, when the challenges come, the best will come out of you. So I am sure this is a time for every one of us here to express the best out of us, to bring out the most important innate fighting spirit out of us. And let us, uh, without any ego, without any uh, clash of thoughts, let us work with a common mission that the people who come into the severe corona should be protected, should be able to give a life, should be able to come back to the, return back to the family. We can be happy if they say the death mortality is only 1.1 percentage, but the person who is dying for that particular family, that one percentage is a hundred percentage. And uh, it, it is a very painful moment. Uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank all the uh, committed, dedicated doctors working day and night in the ICUs and all the uh, learned scientists who are working way to bring out the protocol for your human service of helping our humanity. And we all are with you. The medical fraternity is with you. The community is with you. Let us all join hands together and uh, bring and uh, I mean, win this fight against the corona and to ensure that we learned colleagues will be able to do contribute something good to the society. Thank you very much and looking forward to hear from you and uh, I mean, uh, work uh, in, in unison for the welfare of our country. So now we move on to the panel discussion session uh, where I would like to invite our moderator, Dr. Prachi Sate, to take the panel discussion forward. The most awaited session that is what when roadmap for a better tomorrow. Over to you, Dr. Prachi Sate, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have really had very eminent speakers presenting their points of view for trying to mitigate and ultimately eradicate this pandemic. So during this uh, panel discussion, which we have planned, I would like to invite the eminent participants or panelists for this discussion, because there are lots of questions coming from the audience as well. I would like to invite the Dr. S. Rajesh, who is an IFS officer, is Dr. Rajesh here? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So he is the director of COVID-19 Management Core Team, Department of Health and Research under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. The second panelist I would like to invite is Dr. Yatin Mehta, whom you have already heard at the beginning of this uh, webinar, who is the chairman, Institute of Critical Care and Anesthesiology at Medanta, the Medicity Gurga. The next panelists are Dr. Abdul Ansari, who is the Director of Critical Care Services at Nanavati Super Speciality Hospital, Mumbai, as well as Dr. Purvesh Umrania, Consultant Intensivist from Bhailal Amin General Hospital, Baroda. Welcome, Dr. Ansari, and welcome, Dr. Umrania. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for inviting me. And the next panelist is Dr. Raji Paul. He's the senior consultant, physician, and intensivist at Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad, who has large experience of treating cytokine storm in various conditions, including sepsis and including COVID. Uh, we have Dr. Dipanjan Chatterjee here as an eminent panelist from cardiac anesthesiology critical care and ECMO services from Medica Super Speciality Hospital, Kolkata. Dr. Dipanjan. Dr. Dipanjan. Yeah. Right, hello. Good, so you seem to be right out of operation theater. Welcome as a panel. It's all COVID, it's all COVID now. All COVID, right. And of course, last but not the, not the least, one very eminent panelist is Dr. Professor Zolt Molnar, 
who is also going to contribute his international viewpoint during this panel discussion. Dr. Zold? Right. Thank you, so, I'm here. Uh, right. So let us begin with a question to Dr. Rajesh to start with. We have got very large number of cases and we are really drowning. We are actually drowning in the second wave of COVID with almost three and a half lakh cases being added every day. So what do you think is our preparedness and strategies to navigate through this severe grim situation of upsurge? And mortality also, which is rising, maybe because the numbers are so high, even though the percentage of mortality is small, the number, total number is very high. So how do you want, uh, how do you tell us how, about the preparedness of governance and also for the testing capacity, which is going to yeah. be one of the very important aspects? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, already mentioned uh, by the experts who have spoken previously, who touched upon the medical side, and the inclusive aspects of uh, governing uh, the challenge. But coming to the testing, which is one of the uh, basic pillars of response, as you know, uh, if we share today's situation, we have done more than 19 uh, lakh tests today, which is one of the uh, like significant uh, milestones we have retest. And uh, yes, uh, currently uh, we have capacity of doing that much. And uh, we have uh, RT-PCR, which is a gold standard uh, uh, measure for uh, testing, and that is available now in more than... Uh, we, uh, we have uh, sufficient uh, uh, levels of production capacity also in the country uh, with respect to RT-PCR and uh, other uh, rapid antigen kits. So from the uh, testing perspective, yes, we have to further enhance uh, to deal with the challenge. And for that, uh, certain measures have been already put in, which is uh, focusing on enhancing the capacity by addition, adding more RT-PCR labs, which is an activity we, we are very much on it, 24 into 7. Similarly, uh, like adding additional RNA extraction machines and then uh, running the machines to the complete uh, potential, like, uh, uh, like three cycles uh, as much as possible with the added uh, technical manpower. And uh, then complementing all this with the uh, uh, mobile testing laboratories for remote and rural areas, which is also important. So uh, yes, the ecosystem is highly geared up uh, to respond to the situation. Yes, uh, we also have to add uh, in highly concentrated areas, uh, maybe with uh, high throughput uh, machines, which can, uh, you know, like give quick turnarounds for the testing. So as of now, uh, we are all uh, like out going to improve the uh, testing capacity to take at least to 25 and plus. So that's the situation. And uh, for the testing and diagnostics, uh, we have more than 1,200 plus products uh, which are validated for uh, application in the country, which includes even like 442 products which are indigenously developed. So our ecosystem is uh, all at uh, like work, uh, pushing uh, for further enhancement of testing. This is a quick uh, reflection uh, on that side. Thank you. It is quite hard to hear that, that the government is really going all the way out to improve the capacity and it is, it is really available to general public. Here as a clinician, I would like to add something that what we are observing in practice is that somebody develops a mild symptom, cough, cold, or maybe just fever and approaches a general practitioner and he tells, okay, you start with this preliminary treatment, see how it goes, and then you test yourself. And in that time, three to four days are just wasted, wasted in the sense, this person is still not isolated. This person is mixing up in the family members or at workplace and probably increasing the R factor that the index case affecting other pa patients and creating more cases. So what would you recommend as far as this scenario is concerned? Because generally people are testing slightly later, not on day one of symptoms. This is a clinical yeah. problem. I think we need to uh, uh, support more with the ICT measures uh, to have a better and efficient response. At the same time, uh, uh, we are pushing fast uh, for a, you know, like a high turnaround of uh, testing and uh, also to 
uh, share the results as immediately as possible. We have an artificial app which is capturing the data and uh, sending the messages also to the uh, concerned persons. Yeah, but yes, uh, it has to be like performing more efficient to the. Right. Uh, so since IMA body is involved in this, I think this is one of the important message that we have to share with all the medical practitioners for a country across that as soon as the first symptom develops, instead of waiting for them to develop further symptoms, testing should be done earlier. Probably that will mitigate the spread to other members, other family members or other society. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. I would like to ask, a question to Dr. Yatin Mehta. Dr. Mehta, you have led a team at Medanta successfully treating patients with COVID right from the initial days. Uh, what are the challenges you saw at the beginning and how it has changed over time, you feel? And what do you think should be the current scenario, current treatment protocol, which would help to reduce the mortality or length of stay of patients in the hospital? See, what initially when the patients came in, uh, the protocols were not standardized, the PPEs were not available, the staff was petrified of taking care of these patients. So everything was working against us and slowly over a period of time, not only us, the rest of the world also learned and modified. The protocols have been modified by the uh, Ministry of Health in Veha, ICMR and Ministry of Health uh, over a period of time and they're still ongoing. So I'm glad that ICMR is now less uh, bureaucratic and more dynamic. So I must congratulate uh, everybody um, in the, the team that they have changed over a period of time as, uh, as it evolves. So that's a good thing to do. Uh, now the therapies are pretty standardized and many, many therapies because of the time constraint have been experimental and investigational. So those things are still going on. And one thing I would just like to say that basically only two things which are shown to reduce uh, mortality. One is uh, steroids and um, the second is uh, um, uh, remdesivir has not shown mortality benefits, so reduction in hospital stay. These are the two proven uh, therapies. Uh, but otherwise mortality benefit is not really shown because these are short, very short period of time. One year is very short to learn about a new, a new disease. So we still, one good thing is a lot of research has come out quickly. I mean, the ICMR uh, approves it very quickly or ethics committee approves it very quickly and you are able to finish in a few months time and most of the journals within four to six weeks either say yes or they say no and they publish including NEGM and uh, JAMA and Lancet and so on. So, so a lot of science has come out, some of it pretty f fast and some of it uh, not great. But one should be open to new therapies. That's what I'm saying because this is there is no wonder drug which will cure this disease. It's killing large right. number of patients, still it's increasing numbers. So one should be open to newer ideas and the use of adjuvant therapies does make sense in certain situations. If the cytokine storm kills, which has been shown after a week, cytokine storm happens and that leads to organ dysfunction. So anything which you can do to attenuate the cytokine storm, for whatever modality, uh, may be helpful, but we need, need to analyze the data and keep our minds open. That's what I would like to say. There is one more question, which is not related directly to ICU, but you being in a transplant center, I think it becomes very valid for lots of doctor fraternity also, that people who have undergone transplant and are on immunosuppressants, what would be the advice for vaccination? No, I don't think there is a problem. Yesterday I was uh, also asked that uh, if a patient is uh, has undergone transplant and is there any contraindication? Not really. I think they are more immunocompromised and they are more likely to get into trouble if they because I have seen the patients post liver and kidney transplant who get COVID and the mortality is very high. Absolutely. So, so it is very important that one should go ahead with vaccination without hesitation even in transplant patients and there is one more thing are the caretakers of the transplant patient who are very close vicinity of a transplanted patient also should look after their own vaccination at a greater priority so that they should not carry infection to the transplant patient there. Right. right. I would like to ask a question to Dr. Abdul Ansari and Dr. Purvesh. Both of you come from Western India and it is really so 
you know frightening in western india pune mumbai ahmedabad are really on fire we can say so western india has been the most affected and specific specific cities like mumbai and ahmedabad so what are your comments on treatment strategies for critically ill patients and your experiences on treatment outcomes so dr ansari first so i uh... Uh, I, I missed the last part of your question. So, uh, apart from the number of cases that we handled, uh, was there anything specific you asked your about the experience and treatment outcomes of hospitalized patients? Because in hospitalized patients, almost fifteen percent is mortality. Right, right. So, Doctor Prachi, I think for, first of all, you have been also witnessing this bad COVID, uh, you know, second wave. Uh, Pune has been uh, probably at times worse affected than Mumbai. Yeah. And Mumbai had always taken the lead. Uh, the whole last year, we actually were swamped by the cases, yeah. and uh, uh, you know the state authorities as well as the BMC did a wonderful, you know, uh, kind of task of ultimately having a centralized distribution of cases and ramped up their jumbo facilities. But apart from that, as a uh, as a clinician, when I looked at the initial cases, as Dr. Yatin also said, that we were initially very worried what to do with them. There was no guidance. The guidance was actually living. it was an evolving picture but what we realized and what has uh, held with us for the last one year is the triangular approach that means you need to have an antiviral on board if possible for the severe ones an anti inflammatory drug uh, steroid or any other immunomodulatory agent as necessary and finally anticoagulation so if these three things have been uh, you know uh, as cornerstone of your therapy and then your usual good medical care in the critical care usually you should be able to tide over majority of the patients we nearly have treated around 4000 cases as at nanavati hospital and as a group uh, max group has treated 26000 cases over the last one year and we have been sharing ideas with all our places in delhi and uh, in gurgaon as well as in mumbai and uh, our uh, institutional mortality rate has been fluctuating between 5.5 to 6.4% but as you actually said the uh, the icu hardcore mortality has been going up to 15 to 18% at times even 20% and the worst part was the invasive mechanical ventilated patients mortality that can go up to 40% at times and sometimes a dismal 50 55% in a bad case scenario especially when the case mix is not good but i think the learning message was to defer the intubation which we initially were trying to do a kind of a right timing and it has also been shown that the timing is really not having a great impact unless you have gone through the you know oxygen supporting therapy in a very uh, escalated manner initially using your oxygen very carefully and then going up to high flow nasal cannula mixing up with an iv when the work of breathing is going up and trying to defer invasive ventilation as much as possible doing awake proning and probably this is what has given us a little more confidence over the past couple of months even when the second wave came in barring the number of beds we were able to probably produce the same kind of result this time and as far as remdesivir is concerned i think that should be reserved for only the severe ones uh, steroids we are definitely more pro now but uh, we had our internal audit we were using in uh, approximately 60% of the patients before probably now we are using up to 80 to 90% of the patient with steroid in the intensive that's right so while we are talking about steroids i really want to send a message across to whole of the doctor fraternity who is listening to this talk or may listen to it later dr aparna mukherjee also showed it very importantly that that is one of the things you know dexa 6 mg some trials which showed the benefit but unfortunately when we are so much pro steroid the doses being used which are generally observed in informal surveys are extremely high and there are post covid complications that are coming in because of high use of steroids like very high incidence of mucormycosis for that matter is dr aparna here if she wants to reiterate the dose of uh, steroids uh yes yes as you rightly said that the dose of steroid is also important so what the recovery trial the one that i was trying to show you was like uh, had suggested 6 mg per day dose of dexamethasone right. or equivalent dose we can use right so it is really a small dose but sometimes it has been seen that if the patient is not getting better the doctor fraternity has started using higher and higher dosages and it is really bad to see patients coming back 
with mucormycosis like fungal infections and one Madam, I, I would like to uh, yes. yeah, yeah i mean regarding this intensive care unit treatment uh, i i mean can't agree with dr ansari more uh, uh, but i would like to tell you that uh, in our experience and i mean across the board i think what everyone uh, would have experienced and as dr ansari has also mentioned uh, invasively ventilated patient the recovery rate is probably i mean less than 50% so i mean early use of antivirals and uh, steroids i think in stable patients also if the crp is high or lung involvement is high i mean think you, if you start using remdesivir if they don't recover or start showing this uh, uh, decrease in clinical signs after 3 4 days of uh, starting the symptoms so early use of remdesivir followed by steroids has helped us in reducing the admissions in the icu so i think every effort should be put uh to ensure that patient don't land in the icu at the first place if they have reached us uh, in time i mean see being a referral center i think all of us work in a tertiary care center so we get uh, bad patients who are already deteriorated and come to us after 10 12 days but yeah. if patients reaches us in time say initial 4 5 days then early use of remdesivir helps in uh, entry in the icu i mean avoiding entry in the icu absolutely no. and so monitoring of inflammatory markers helps us in choosing these kind of patients and 3 4 you. days of antiviral and still inflammatory markers are not improving then use steroids judiciously correct. even when the requirement is not there correct so the trial actually says or talks about patients who develop hypoxia because they have studied that population but you are right i also would agree with you that if the inflammatory markers are rising and not coming down that is the beginning of the cytokine storm and that is the time where we have to pick up any immunomodulatory therapy that's right thank you for that there was a question by dr rafik and he says whether the mortality is counted on um, covid mortality for the patients who are covid positive in the sense after about 15 days or more patients are still in the icu maybe in ards maybe on ventilator they become covid negative and they are counted as covid negative and in the mortality probably they are not counted and does that affect because obviously ultimately if they die it is because of covid that they have died so i think in this also i would like to have opinion from dr aparna what what do you feel about the mortality counting uh yes madam the mortality he is rightly uh, pointed out that may not happen within the time period when the covid uh, rt pcr is still positive in most many of the cases we see that it is a delayed so that's why as you could see most of the studies have taken a 28 day mortality as the outcome and uh, when counting the mortality due to covid this is also counted as uh, if there has been a covid um, episode and then the patient is still in hospital as you said you know in icu ventilated and then succumbs it is definitely counted as covid still but when COVID. it is like out of hospital death there it becomes a bit tricky as to whether right. it is being counted as covid or not Uh, right. so we are trying to actually do a, some kind of a verbal autopsy and see for that whether this is whether we can actually label it to covid and because in all probability it will be due to covid but right, right. now uh, they wouldn't be counted right so the next next question goes to dr rajiv paul from hyderabad uh dr rajiv Uh, i think you also have been using quite a few innovative therapies in the manage management of uh, covid patients not only innovative therapies i think innovative approaches as well would you like to share your experience and brief the audience about how you treat covid patients and your experience and perspective as an intensivist please uh dr rajiv yeah Good evening, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Prachi, I think I am not audible. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Prachi. Yes, yes, and, you are uh, audible. Uh, what out of out of today's presentations uh, that went on in the last one hour, I got one interesting uh, update that the three pillars of uh, success will be the three eyes. What are the three eyes? Uh, number one is ICMR. Number two is the IMA, and number three is the industry. And all three are present there today. 
We have ICMR. Of course, have... ICU. You can't forget ICU. Yes, that was us coming to. That is the that is the that is the culmination. <laughs> so all these three, the ICU is the basic the epicenter of everything. So the support. I'm talking of the support of everyone. The these three bodies, the ICMR, the industry, and the IMA, ably supporting the ICU, the fourth eye, or the main eye, is the watchword or what is the victory which is going to happen in this pandemic. Yeah. I was very, uh, I mean, impressed with uh, Dr. Uh, Mukherjee's uh, talk and the ICMR's uh, programs or the dynamic uh, strategy changes that they have been doing. And uh, we all know, as all doctors uh, here, we all know that uh, we started with uh, the basic molecule HCQS and then now we are talking about tocilizumab and baratacinib. So we have gone through a lot of changes in the protocol and a lot of changes in the treatment. But all doctors, again, I tell you, all of you know it, WHO watchword was for 2020 was bad bugs, no drugs. Now, what is the now what we are good dealing is no drugs and no hugs. So WHO projected bad bugs and bad uh, bugs and no drugs. From that, we have come to the stage where we call no drugs and no hugs also. So you can't treat your patient, neither can your family members treat your patient. So that is the catastrophe which has uh, been the COVID pandemic. In any other disease, if your loved one is in the ICU, on a ventilator, on a deathbed, or on a, in a very critical situation, you can allow your family members talk to the, the they would be beside the side of the patient. If the conscious patient is still conscious, on a DNR mode, still they would be talking to the patient. Here we have someone who would be dying with no relatives, no one in front of him. So it's become a situation called bad drug, bad uh, such a disease where you have no drugs and no hugs also. You pass off, come into the ICU on your own and go away. If you're lucky, if you're lucky enough, you get out of the ICU. If, unlucky, if you have the unlucky ones, you go out alone. So this has put us the ICU treatment and I don't want to really tell you anything about what we discussed. Dr. Mukherjee has very amply told about the treatment protocols about when to use remdesivir, when to use tocilizumab, and uh, how important it is to use uh, plasma and, to, and remdesivir early in the disease. The concept is very clear. I mean, it is from day one, which we know this, that uh, remdesivir is antiviral drug. It doesn't require rocket science to know that if you don't use an antiviral drug in the second week, after day 10, day 12, when the virus has already done extensive damage in cytokine storm is at the peak, I mean, the, obviously it's not going to work. So it has to be used in the first week, uh, Dr. Mukherjee told in his first nine days. So that's what we actually follow. Even today, I had a question from a relative 10 days post the patients admitted in my ICU and I did not use remdesivir. So I have been barrage of questions I'm facing from the relatives, why didn't you give remdesivir? So there are a lot of uh, ifs and buts which will go on and we have to convince our patients in the best way we can. We have been using remdesivir early. We have been using tocilizumab in some patients, but again, all of you know, we are running short of tocilizumab and we are very selective now in which subgroup of patients we are using. Plasma, yes, if the patient turns up early, we are sometimes using, but not as a routine and uh, generally not, definitely not after seven days. What we are more challenging for finding is that uh, the doctors and the workload of doctors, how to mitigate the workload of the doctors and the hospital staff or the nurses and the healthcare workers. There is a recent study published in JAMA, which basically took the, showed that increasing workload, increasing mortality. And uh, though it's not a, a peer reviewed as yet, but it is, uh, it is quite a good uh, article to read. And we all know that it again doesn't require a rocket science to know the mode or workload. Obviously you don't have much drugs to deal with. We are left with only steroids, only remdesivir and then followed by steroids. And then the ventilator takes over uh, if uh, lucky you to get out of it. So, in such situation, the doctor's workload is the most important thing, which ultimately will improve the outcomes of the ICU patients. And how best to reduce the doctor's outload is to prioritize patients. Earlier discharge of patients from ICU who don't really require ICU care and having a step down ICUs in all hospitals who are dealing with COVID patients so that the doctors in the ICUs are not stressed with the patients who don't require extensive care. So doctors and other nurses workload has to reduce. Second part is doctors, uh, there will be situations when family members will be seeing a progress of a patient on a ventilator or not in the ICU improving. And we have seen sudden deaths of patients. It could be an acute my myocardial infarction. It could be an acute thromboembolic episode. We have seen CVSTs in patients. So oh, we should all prepare our patients, family members, even though the progress curve is improving, the chance of uh, recovery or guarantee is not guaranteed uh, till we 
the patient is out of ICU or on the process of discharge. So that uh, will uh, basically mitigate many of the uh, difficult situations that the patients are going through. Again, prioritization of patients in the ICU will help in identifying patients who need early ventilation. It is not that every patient would require a ventilator, and, but yes, there are subgroups of patients who would uh, benefit from early ventilation. The younger group, yes, will benefit from early ventilations. I mean, there's uh, definitely would be a questionable to ventilate someone who is extreme, excessive, extremely old with too many comorbidities and then and uh, having an already a poor outcome chances and uh, resource utilization has to be prioritized in such situations. This is a difficult call for the doctors to take, but yes, the doctors have to sit down as we, with the family members and discuss the pros and cons of ventilating such a patient who is a 55 year old with already a CKD or maybe an old uh, MI with a multiple stents done and who is now with the uh, vasopressors and uh, on, the, on, the, on the verge of ventilation. So prioritizing such patient to non-ventilator approach would be the, I would, the way we are looking forward if the numbers of pandemic, the way we are seeing, are continuing. Right. And uh, the other part which, the, which we, I'm sorry, one moment, yeah. Another part which all of us are feeling as doctors is the helplessness, uh, both from the patient side, the family side, and the doctor side. The patients are helpless. They are on the stuck on the bed. They see impending death in front of them. The opposite patient or the next patient uh, suddenly crashes or suddenly becomes bad, goes on a ventilator, and uh, that uh, spells an impending doom on the patient. Same with the doctors. We are treating the patient. The nurses and the PPs are continuously working for six to eight hours, treating the patient, doing your best, and suddenly all of a sudden you see the patient uh, uh, just uh, deteriorating in front of you and you're just uh, helpless trying to save the patient. And the family members, yes, they're not getting proper updates. They want that the uh, updates, updates to be coming very frequently, which previously non-COVID patients would get uh, many, through many sources, in doctors, nurses, but now the source is becoming more difficult for them to approach. They can't come into the ICU. They're completely dependent on the ICU doctor or the primary physician. And that is increasing their, their restlessness and also their... Uh, uh, impatience and many times that is leading to some sort of a discordance in the patient and the family between the family and the doctors, which we all have to understand and best how best we track it, we have to find out. Right. That is really a grim reality and ground reality all the doctors we are facing in the ICU. Let's hope everything comes under control fast. The next question I would like to ask to Dr. Professor Zold. Uh, Dr. Zold. You have used adjunct therapies in many patients suffering from critical illness due to COVID-19 and associated multiple organ failure with septic shock. So what is your comment on the outcomes with such type of therapies? No, thank you for, for this question. It's a very uh, tough one because uh, at least here in Hungary, we have very high mortality and those patients who end up on a mechanical ventilator uh, regardless whether they uh, receive treatment very few survives so we have a very high mortality rate so one can ask that if your mortality rate is so high then why on earth do you want to implement an expensive treatment and this is a, a fair comment but as we heard before if uh, uh, if it is 1%, then those uh, relatives and, and, uh, would be, and the patient will be grateful if uh, this 1% survival or 10% or 15% survival uh, can be due to something that the physician considers as uh, potentially useful. So, um, and to be honest, as far as the cytosol therapy is concerned in general, we don't really have frank evidence that it increases survival because it has not been shown by large prospective randomized controlled studies. But then it takes us even further because show me anything that has convincingly shown to improve survival, which must be accepted all over the planet as a, a universal treatment. So in critical care, it is extremely difficult to find one single alternative treatment which, in, which uh, significantly uh, improves survival. So even if you look at uh, the steroids in COVID, this is still uh, a fluent subject. And uh, 
and uh, the difference between the, the um, mm, uh, treatment arm and the control arm in the recovery study wasn't like 80% survived in, in uh, the mm, in, in the steroid treated group and only 10% survived. So it is marginal, it is, it is strong, it is statistically significant and it is a robust study. But, but again, uh, in intensive care, we, we have to be really cautious uh, about evaluating our treatment alternatives simply based on data uh, proving survival benefit on an evidence level. And it is not by chance that if you read uh, current JAMA, New England Journal, critical care papers, what is the primary outcome? It's not mortality. It is vasopressor and vent ventilator free days. Because this is what you, you, you don't give oxygen to a patient to improve survival. You give oxygen because you want to improve hypoxemia. You don't give noradrenaline to the patient because you want to improve survival. You give noradrenaline because the patient is so hypotensive, which is life-threatening. You treat the patient with renal replacement therapy because otherwise, uh, because the kidneys cannot do the job. And, uh, you know, yeah. so it's, uh, it's uh, uh, we have physiological rationales and, and uh, at the moment, um, this is what we have. Uh, I'm sorry if I went a bit too far with my answer. No, no, it is absolutely right what you have said. I think because of COVID, the whole world, even the non-medical people have got aware of what happens uh, in cytokine storm or so-called cytokines when they play havoc in the body or they cause dysregulated immune response. Maybe because of this, more and more doctors and more and more people get aware that similar thing happens in sepsis of any origin and cytokine storm happens in so many things. Now people know about IL-6, but only certain intensivists have been following up with levels like IL-6 or interleukins, various types, you know, in our routine septic patients. But because of this, I think the world over, the awareness will increase about the cytokine storm and dysregulated immunity and the therapies which are like cytokine removal or blood, or blood purification with various methods. So thanks, thanks for your contribution. May I make thanks. another comment? Yes. A quick comment. This COVID-19 will change our approach to the scientific um, management as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So nothing will be the same uh, yes, from now on. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. We are we are now publishing papers before print before even uh, peer review, right? Yeah. Uh, all data now is recommended to be available for all of us. Your data in India, patient data, will be available for should be available for me to compare, because there is no time to wait for one year uh, for a result to be published. Our patients cannot wait for that long, so we are heading uh, into a very exciting uh, era. Right. Uh, very interesting times. Yeah. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor Zolt, for sharing your viewpoints. So now talking about this adjunct therapies or additional therapies to improve the survival even by 10%, 15%, there is one more therapy which we can consider and I would like to invite Dr. Deepanjan Chatterjee to take that question. So what are the newer modes of treatment for severely affected COVID-19 patients that you have tried where most of the drugs are experimental drugs and probably have not been able to save a patient of ARDS or the severely affected lungs. What can help you to travel an extra mile to generate the evidence in these times of crisis and offer certain therapy to your patients? So I think you come from the center, which is best for ECMO facilities. So would you like to share some of your experience? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks to give me the opportunity to speak on it. Uh, we have been, uh, actively promoting ECMO in these patients uh, who are not getting oxygenated even after ventilation. So uh, in the first last year, we, we had uh, our experience uh, was initially, which was difficult to start off ECMO in, the, uh, in general because of the lack of awareness among the people. But as the time has passed, we are now 
getting uh, referrals not only from physicians but also from the uh, also from the patients relatives themselves okay so it is it is it is a time now when ecmo is actively used in our center we are almost running 20 to 25 pa patients con concurrently on ecmo so this is a last ditch effort to save the patients when all the efforts to increase his oxygenation has failed so uh, in these patients what we have found that uh, not only just putting them on ecmo uh, none of the drugs will be helping to improve the lung conditions but certain things like uh, proning multiple proning episodes on uh, ecmo uh, maybe some patients even seven eight or nine times proning that, that has helped them to get the lung functions improved and in some per percentage of patients who have had cytokine storm on ECMO, we have used cytoscorp and uh, we have got results, but it is not very, very encouraging because once the patient is on ECMO and with the cytokine storm, the mortality rate is very, very high. What other things that we have faced is that uh, uh, these patients, they have a very prolonged duration on the ECMO support. That is a one thing that is very difficult for us to explain to the relatives initially because it is, it is that the, the relatives are very anxious that they are not improving even after the third week. Uh, uh, some patients have required more than a month of ECMO therapy and then they have gone home. Uh, the mortality rate in our first uh, COVID phase was almost uh, 60%. So 40% of our patients who were not getting oxygenated even on ventilation, they went home with the ECMO support. The second phase has just started and uh, it, we are too busy to calculate our, give our data mm -hmm. right now because it is it's a very busy schedule for us. Absolutely. But uh, uh, what we can say that uh, this therapy is very intense uh, and it can be practiced. Many of the hospitals in India are practicing uh, ECMO. It is a, a, even in worldwide, in the Europe, US, Australia, Singapore, everywhere. We initial the data that came out from China was very dismal. But as we went ahead, we have found that the outcome is not that dismal at all. Some data are showing quite a uh, encouraging uh, outcome of up to 60 to 65 percent. But on an average, 40 to 50 percent outcome on ECMO is possible. Uh, and it has to be a very, very good critical care along with ECMO support because ECMO support, we are just oxygenating the patient. The all other things of the patient has to be taken care of. Many of these patients are on multiple organ support. They are having AKI, we, they are on CCRRT, uh, they are having other organ dysfunctions. Many of them have cardiomyopathies as well. So they, they need to have a very good critical care along with the ECMO support. The only ECMO support room is not going to save these patients. So our experience has been very good and uh, we have been able to give this encouragement to all other uh, people around in the east, at least in eastern india many of the people are very uh, eager uh, to get to our uh, center or other centers where ecmo is available uh, one more thing that i found that uh, many of the centers are referring patients uh, a little bit early with the ventilation when the patient has gone on ventilation uh, they may not uh, be till now, that time ready for ECMO, but they have referred. And uh, it has been found that most of the ARDS patients, if they are treated either on ECMO or not on ECMO in centers, we, which are centers of excellence for ARDS treatment, there the results are much better. So we have got patients from outside who have not required ECMO, but the ventilations could be weaned off at some point of time and the patients have gone home. So... ARDS management 
should be done in specialized centers and large volume uh, where the large volume of patients can be treated that has helped us that's great it is really encouraging to hear that we ultimately believe in the nature's power of healing and when we give rest to the diseased lung we allow the lungs to take rest and heal from within to come out of fibrosis and inflammation that is how the ecmo would help ecmo by itself may not be curing but it allows the lung to buy time to recover itself have you had to refer some patients further for lung transplant who are not recovering from ecmo so uh, uh, lung transplant in covid is not a very bright idea they there uh, we have not uh, got a very good uh, outcome with the lung transplant patients at least in india uh, the outcome in the long term for lung transplant is not that good so if we have a patient if we if we if the patient can recover on his own with the uh, with ecmo support and then with the prolonged physiotherapy that is the best for him so nice. we have uh, referred patients for uh, lung transplants uh, some of them have had uh, lung transplants done there are very few centers in india who are presently doing lung okay. transplants and the number of lungs is very less so uh, availability of lung is very less short and the number of patients who are needing who need this uh, therapy are too high so lung transplant is only for very selective patients for the rest we would advise to go for a lung rest as you said on ecmo support if, if it needed it it has to be a prolonged ecmo some some one of our longest patients went home after 48 days of ecmo so uh, we have to just persevere and continue the treat therapy of these patients excellent thank you for sharing your experience which is really so encouraging so i think that brings us towards the end of this panel discussion we started right from prevention and testing right up to ecmo and towards lung transplant we discussed most of the aspects of covid Dr. so Prachi, it is really yes i'm just interrupting you nip uh i just wanted to ask dr zolt uh, since he is uh, about the use of cytosol uh any difference uh, or any use of um, inflammatory markers uh, to help you decide early use of cytosol uh, in covid patients rather than waiting for the vasopressor requirement or ventilator requirement that is where uh, i need to start early yeah yeah where inflammation is increasing you mean yes yes <clears throat> to be honest um, as uh, as yatin has already pointed out it's the clinical picture so uh, and, but it is it is a good signal that you have elevated the uh, biomarkers but we don't consider uh, we don't wait for the biomarkers to be as high as in septic shock so we have a lower threshold so the, if the patient's condition is really critical and uh, there is a signal that inflammation is ongoing and uh, and uh, the patient doesn't respond to your standard medical therapy as usually then i mean it is a time to consider but we have very limited data to tell you exactly <laughs> what is that il6 level or or whatever you measure you know when to start so um, it remains a difficult um, decision this is why we need you the intensive therapist the devoted experienced well trained intensivists at the bedside because you are the only one at the moment who can make the right decision and you don't waste resources and uh, but you also uh, select the right patients absolutely right thanks for that comment dr zol I, i do apologize i have to jump to a meeting but you wanted to conclude it anyway Yes, thank fine. you yes so just a summary to take home message i think it is important that instead of wasting initial time of 3 to 4 days after the symptoms have started testing should be done immediately and isolation should start immediately we may start using masks even at home for reverse isolation of elderly people at home so that we are not spreading the disease for them then of course dr yatin mehta mentioned about the challenges 
of picking them up early and we must pick the patients up who have got potential to go towards the severe disease and probably the adjunctive therapies would be useful if we can pick up the patients who have potential to go towards severe illness dr arshana i really thank you for the insight and the proven therapies which you summarized dr ansari and dr umrania and dr rajiv paul i thank all of you for sharing your experiences and ekmo was a different viewpoint for all of us to ponder upon so with that i thank all the eminent panelists and i thank dr neera gupta for giving me opportunity to moderate this session of interesting panel discussion yes mr sir uh, thank you it was a wonderful session and we have been sitting to our chairs for the last two and a half hours and we don't know how the time passed in fact and i am really thankful to all the doctors the intensivists ma'am you especially and dr zolt who has joined us from overseas and uh, particularly the intensivists who are very occupied these days in their icus and despite that they have uh, taken out a good time for, for us i really thank them from we and the biocon who have facilitated us for doing this event with their knowledge base because we were not known to so much of details of about the uh, uh, therapies and these things but then they have educated us to do this and i am thankful to all finally for uh, joining us and making this a successful event i hope we will meet in another such knowledge series and thank you all and have a nice evening